Okay, can people hear me now? Is this working now? Am I live here? Did I push the right button? All right, if anyone can respond in the chat, if you can hear me now, let me know. Um, okay, someone said now. Uh, what does that mean? It works now. Okay, it's live now. Okay, we're live. Uh, right. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I had not clicked the magic button, which does actually go do it. And so I just talked for about 10 minutes about the whole introduction part, and, and that was just an exercise of me talking. So let's start over then. Uh, let's go back to the beginning, and let's do this. So um, if anyone, uh, can you all hear me and see me? I guess that's the first question. Uh, there we go, he says. OK. All right, so um, can you all see I have uh, an outline, which I'm sharing on the screen right now. Can you all see my, my outline? Yes, OK, so outline. First of all, two parts of this, uh, do a brief introduction, talk about uh, what this stream is, what we're going to do, how this works, um, and also talk a bit about the bigger picture, bigger, bigger policy picture. OK. You can see HackMD. So I have a document, a document on HackMD called Outline, which you should be able to see, uh, which is just my, my quick outline here. I'm going to use HackMD, by the way, as, as my code review tool. Um, we're going to be look, looking at documents in HackMD and editing them live. Um, there will be a recording uh, to replay this. This is, this is being recorded on, on YouTube. And uh, if uh, well, assuming I've done everything right, uh, it worked in my tests, uh, this will all be recorded, and you can, you can watch this whole thing uh, whenever you want. Um, so um, welcome, everyone. I apologize for the, for the false start there. Um, I'm Dan Gilman. This is my very first live stream ever, and I'm already making mistakes, so this is great. Uh, <laughs> um, so I have three time blocks set up uh, over today, tomorrow, and, and Thursday uh, to, to, to do this. I don't actually know how much time this, this stair process is going to take. Um, so we'll see. It's possible we'll end it early. It's possible we'll end up and we'll need more time. Um, if so, I'll probably look to schedule some more time to, to finish up. Um, so we'll just kind of see how things go. Um, and um, yeah, uh, and, and, and anytime, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. That's going to be a recurring theme. I'm going to say it a lot. So um, I'm the, so I'm, so first of all, who am I? Uh, I'm Dan Goman, and uh, I wear a bunch of different hats in the WebAssembly world. Um, one of them is that I'm the champion of several of the WASI APIs that we've been talking about today. I'm, a, I'm sort of the, the official champion for WASI file system. Wazi Cox, Wazi Random. Um, and so the champion means that I'm the person who is in charge of making sure that these APIs are progressing through the standards process. Um, I'm also sort of the editor that, that actually takes responsibility for incorporating changes and, and building consensus. And so part of what we're doing today here is doing a code review um, in public as much as possible here, to the extent that I'm technologically able to do this. Um, so just really collect the feedback uh, that everyone has, make sure that, um, that people can sort of see how this process works what these APIs are and how this works, and um, and we can make changes as we go here. Um, I work for Fastly. Um, Fastly is a member of the Bytecode Alliance, and um, and I'm an active participant in the W3C WebAssembly Community Group and the WASI subgroup. Um, so for the bigger picture around WASI, I want to talk a bit about uh, WASI Preview One and WASI Preview Two and how these things work together and how they fit, fit together in the bigger picture. So WASI Preview One was released in 2019. Um, it's an API that's been out there for a while, and at this point, um, uh, it, it's actually gotten adopted in quite a lot of places. Um, we have WASI support in um, PHP, Python, Ruby, C Sharp, um, lots of different languages, uh, Go, Rust, C++, um, lots of different languages have added um, WASI support right now. So we actually have a lot of things out, out in the real world, and all this is built on today, WASI Preview 1. Um, it's a set of APIs that was originally derived from Cloud EBI, although it evolved a fair amount. Um, but you can still see the Cloud EVI influence in there. Um, and it's very POSIX oriented. It's very much focused on POSIX style file system APIs, POSIX style clock APIs, and, and a random API, um, and a polling API that's very POSIX y. Um, so, WASI today is very, very POSIX y. But I think what you're going to see today is that even though we're still going to talk about file systems and sockets and kind of traditional POSIX functionality sets, you're going to see how WASI Preview 2 is really a chance to sort of break out of the POSIX mold and, and, and do things differently. Um, WASI Preview 1 is also built on top of the WIDEX IDL, um, which isn't really a great IDL. It was sort of developed very quickly in the early days. We knew we needed something, but we didn't really know what we needed yet. 
So we put together this thing based on S expressions, um, which seemed like it made sense at the time because S expressions is with the WAT format that WASM uses um, is defined in terms of. Um, but the S expressions ended up getting really verbose, especially as we started ending uh, a lot of annotations with these at signs and, and at, at WIDX uh, annotations got really verbose. And so we kind of recognized that like WIDX is a thing that the, the IDL we want to write APIs in is something that we're going to be doing a lot of work in. We want to have a nice human friendly API. And so that kind of led to the development of WIT. Um, and then al along with the development of the component model, kind of developing the other side of it, of recognizing that we need a type system. We want the ability to have APIs that can talk about things in terms of strings and lists and handles and streams. We want this to be the vocabulary instead of pointers and unions and structs. We want to have kind of a higher level vocabulary that we can describe APIs in. Um, because this is what's going to really give us the tools to generate bindings that can go beyond just like POSIX style C APIs into general APIs that can be used by many different languages. Um, so Preview 2 is kind of like the next major big iteration of WASI that we're building. And so Preview 2 is about let's use the WIT IDL that gives us kind of a real IDL with a really friendly syntax and with a really friendly type system that gives us lots of great features and uh, actual semantics for things like handles and, and streams. Um, although some of those things we don't quite have implemented yet, so we're going to have to have, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little later, we're going to have to have replacement for those things as we go here. Um, but at least we, there's a roadmap for how this thing's going to work, and we have an understanding of how they'll fit in. Um, Preview 2 is also going to be the chance where we can incorporate WASI sockets, uh, complete with, with listen, uh, accept, connect, uh, the, the sort of full, um, at least TCP side of, of the, the socket story, um, and, and probably also UDP too, but that'll be something we'll talk about later in the sockets part. Um, WASI Preview 2 will also pull in uh, in bug fixes and lessons learned from Preview 1. Preview 1's been out there for about three years now, and we've learned quite a lot of things that we don't like about it at this point. So we're going to take this opportunity to, to fix those things and, and really move forward to the next level. Um, I also want to call out this moment in time, kind of why we're doing this stream today. Um, this stream is kind of about um, what I've been kind of thinking in my mind is like a last call for WASI Preview 2 to get changes in, to add features, um, which isn't the absolute last call. There will always be opportunities to add new features in the future. And, and there will even be opportunities to make changes in the future. We can always deprecate old things and add new things. But this kind of moment in time, this, this week and the next few weeks, is kind of the last time where it'll be easy to add features. It'll be easy to make changes. Because at this point in time, no one's building anything on top of it yet. There's no tools losing it yet. And so we can easily add things without going through a lot of process and figuring out compatibility requirements. We can just do things. So this is the time. If you want to make changes, um, let's make them now. And so that's why we're going to do this with this API walkthrough right now. It's like, let's make all the changes we can think of now, get things into shape so we won't need to make any changes later on. Um, and with that, uh, the one last bit of introduction I want to do is I want to encourage people to ask questions. Um, definitely ask questions as things go on. And um, uh, I, I want to really emphasize how helpful it is when people ask questions to me. I can sit here and talk um, and, and say what I think is interesting, but it actually helps everyone else, if I can talk about things that everyone else finds interesting. And so questions are kind of the main way that I can get that feedback on like, what do people want to hear about? What do people think is interesting? What's confusing? What doesn't make sense? Um, help me get on those tracks of, of actually explaining things in, in, in ways that make sense. Uh, and you can do that by asking questions. All right, so with that, um, that is my introduction. And I'm going to get ready to move into the very first API, the WASI Random API. So I'm going to take a bit of a break here, um, not a long break, but just enough time to uh, adjust and, and get set up with my new uh, reviewing workflow. Um, this is a great time for questions. If people have any questions, uh, let me know if anything's not working in the stream. And let's put this together here. OK, so I'm going to use HackMD. Um, they have some nice Git integration that I've been liking. So um, let's switch to here. And put a file from GitHub. We're going to do Wazi random first. 
perfect thing to do is look at the readme.md. Okay, I got a question. Are there resources that you can share for the current docs of your, of the, of your due proposal? Um, so the resource I'm gonna share, um, so I'm gonna be writing those resources today. That's kind of what this exercise is about, is like, let's write the documentation as we go here. Um, and so I'll drop in links to everything that I'm doing here. Um, Wazi Clocks is, uh, sorry, Wazi Random is the first one. So let's do Wazi Random. Wazi Random is here. And that's the first one, gonna, first one we're gonna talk about. That should be on your screen at this point. Um, and uh, let's dive in and do it. So this first file we're looking at is the readme. Um, all the WASI proposals are following this uh, WASI uh, proposal template. And so we start out with a readme. And at this point, the readme still has a bunch of fill in the blank things. So I'm gonna start filling in the blanks. That's the first step we're gonna do is gonna go through these readmes and, and really start documenting what these things are. So WASI random is a proposed WebAssembly system interface API. Current phase is phase two. Um, and if people are interested in, in the phase process, I can talk through that. But for now, I'll just keep going. Um, I'm the champion. And uh, one of the things that WASM proposals do, and uh, this is different from, from sort of core WASM proposals, um, in, in the core assembly process, mm -hmm. we have this idea that for a feature to advance to phase four of standardization, um, it needs to be implemented by, I think, I think it's at least two, uh, what we say, major web VMs. Um, and so this makes sense within a, a core web assembly context because the browsers really are the, the main show there. Um, but within WASI, we're focusing on the non-browser use case uh, right now. And so uh, requiring that browsers implement these things doesn't actually make sense because actually, in fact, none of the browsers are implementing WASI at this time. Um, and so what we're, what we're saying is that WASI proposals will define their own advancement criteria and will have the subgroup then approve those criteria. So WASI's, WASI random's criteria for advancing to phase four is um, Wazi Random must have host implementations which can pass the test suite on at least Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Um, so we're aiming for these APIs to be portable. Wazi Random must also have at least two complete independent implementations. Okay, table of contents. Uh, if the explainer is longer than one printed page. So I think that is a part of the template that we don't need to have anymore. Uh, we'll, we'll keep the table of contents because I think we have, we'll say enough things here. Um, so we have introduction, uh, goals, non-goals. Um, we'll update some of these things as we go along. Um, the, the table of contents, we'll actually go back and, and update that later. Uh, so let's get into the actual content here. So we have an introduction. Uh, WASI Random is a WASI API for obtaining random data. Um, I'm going to add, this is going to be cryptographically your pseudo random data. I think it's the key phrase I want to say here. So the, the intent here is that this random data is good enough for seeding crypto cryptographic algorithms. It's strong enough for that purpose. Um, we'll make sure we state that up front. The goals of the API um, allow users to, to use BASI programs to obtain high quality, low level random data and to all source languages to enable DOS protection in their hash maps, you know, some that support it. Um, and actually, I, I should also mention that um, maybe that introduction is a little bit too specific now because we also have another API for sort of low quality random numbers. Um, there's a use case for Wazi Random where languages want to initialize their hash maps with a random key to avoid uh, DOS attacks where people can guess the, the hash, um, hash collisions. Um, so we have an API for that. It's like a weak random number that only gives you um, 128 bits of, of data um, only for that particular purpose. Uh, it's also part of this API. So I'm gonna update the introduction here to not say probably secure, um, but it is pseudo random. And I'm gonna put suitable for cryptography in the API. All right, so some non-goals. Wazi Random actually has quite a lot of non-goals. I'm not gonna read through them all right now. Um, you can kind of go through them yourself if you want to. Um, but random number APIs are, are you know, the actual surface area is, is very simple. It's just like giving some random bytes. Um, 
but kind of the, the, the details of like what kind of endobites are these uh, is kind of subtle. Um, and there's actually two things I want to call out in particular here. One of them is this idea about not aiming to be a full DRBG API um, or even have advanced features. I guess that is another thing we can talk about here. Um, advanced features could include things like um, having the ability to submit entry view back to the system or having the ability to detect errors, um, having the ability to do essentially async random numbers. Uh, like this API is not attempting to be async or, or give you a stream of data or be fallible um, or allow you to interact with a random number generator in any way. It just is as simple as possible. Just here's a way to get random bytes. Um, they're expected to be relatively fast, so you shouldn't have to do your own um, pseudo random number generator on top of it. And uh, it never fails, it never blocks, it just works. Um, that's actually a bit controversial in some contexts because um, if you're on a host machine that perhaps is just booted, you may not have enough entropy to be able to satisfy that. And so uh, what the WASI API here is saying is um, to, to conform to WASI random, um, you need to make sure that you have enough entropy in the host. Um, that's something that WASI will just require up front. And this is a decision that's made in order to attempt to prevent applications from having dangerous fallback paths, which are a well-known security problem. All right, so with all these things that was random is not going to do, that's actually pretty well fleshed out already, so I'm not gonna write anything else there right now. Um, I'm gonna jump into the API walkthrough. So how do you use this API? Um, to do that, I need to pull up the actual Wazi random API first. And the wait.md file. And we have get random bytes. So like these template text. Oh, I gotta edit that aside, don't I? Okay, so we have a function called get random bytes. Um, this is what we're gonna start with. And in uh, source code like Rust, this might look like uh, with some length, besides some U32 value. And it's going to return us a list of bytes. And in the, in the generated bindings for how things work today, uh, returning a list of U8 in Rust will turn into generating a vacuum U8. Um, and so this is essentially how this works. If you're going to get a bytes, um, there's a len which is going to be how many bytes you want. And then um, the bytes will be the random bytes you get from it. Uh, and that's it. This is a very simple API. Um, and that's kind of the point. There's no failure here. There's no um, things aren't ready yet. Uh, there's no configuration you have to do. You just call this function, you just get bytes. And they're the kind of bytes you want for any use case of random numbers, including cryptography. So that's kind of the, the basic use case there. That's all we had to really do. So I'm going to give this a title. Um, main API is getting random bytes. I'm actually going to add a second API. Getting random bytes faster. So in, um, in the API, we have another function, get random music to four. And this is actually identif ident identical to the first API. Um, except that instead of returning a array of bytes, it's going to return a user before. So now we can do our bus code and we can say that bytes are, let's see, data is going to be a user before now. Uh, and that's it. So 
So get rid of U64 is the same semantics as get rid of bytes, except that it's a U64. And one of the things that this does is it avoids going through the, the list allocation. So with lists in Rust, you'll get a VEC, uh, which is dynamically allocated. We have to copy the data in. Um, so with get random 64 you, you know, kind of bypass that. You just get a, a, a 64-bit integer kind of passed to you. So uh, same thing, a little bit faster. So then the third use case is going to be the insecure random. Pass back DOS protection. And so I'm going to grab the API for that one. Looks like this. And all right, we've got some questions here. Um, is it len32 correct? Should be len u32. Uh, Did I get this wrong? Um, yes, I get that wrong. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to write an uh, example of use case. Um, okay, so insecure random here is returning a tuple of two U64s. Two um, in Rust, that will turn into an actual tuple of U64s. Um, and then I'm not going to write up the whole hash, the hash map implementation, but basically we would use these values to initialize the hash map uh, random number function. And so the idea is then that this would be random enough that you would have dot production. Um, the spec for this function is actually written in such a way that um, if an implementation wants to be fully deterministic, it can still implement this function. Um, it's just that the trade offs that you don't get the dot production in that case. So um, we did the to do. Uh, we have insecure random. All right, PV2 looking hella good. Excellent. Um, would it be better to provide a pointer and length to a region in less memory, memory to fill up random bytes? Um, so that's actually a really good question. Um, and that's how PV1 works. Um, PV2 is built on top of the component model. And um, one of the ideas of the component model is that we want APIs to be what we call shared nothing. So we're not going to be passing pointers and sharing buffers. Um, that gives us some really interesting properties. It means that we don't have to worry about questions like, what's the lifetime of a buffer after the call? Right? Do we have to worry about the buffer staying allocated? Um, it means that we can virtualize APIs. So instead of having to have all the APIs implemented by the host machine, um, one WASM component could implement an API that's used by another WASM component. Um, and those WASM components don't have to trust each other. We don't have to trust that I'm giving you pointers to my memory, and I'm trusting you to only look at the memory point to my pointers. I don't have to share my entire memory with you. I can share just, like, I'm passing you this list, and the list gets passed by value. So um, I can I can go into more detail with that, but that's a that's a pretty big property of the Wasm code model. Um, and in a lot of cases, we'll see that um, over time, the stream mechanism is going to be a way that we can use to minimize allocations for for use cases where we're streaming a lot of data and we're not going to be doing allocations all the time. Um, so we'll see how this is going to fit in. Random is, random is kind of a special case uh, of this because uh, right now I think the design is that random is not a stream. Um, random is just a function you can call that you get bytes from. And so that's why it uses a list return value. And uh, that's why we have this C64 special case to, to go faster. So are both key and value, uh, are both key and value of the hash map random? Um, okay, I should be clear about this. Maybe I can clarify this in the uh, in the thing here. So the two the two values here uh, are not key value. These two values are just um, basically it's representing a 120-bit random key. Um, and it just split over two use these fours because that's all we have. Um, we don't have a 128-bit type in, in the way ideal. Um, and so the idea is 128 bits is, is typically considered to be like enough um, entropy for initialization. So we're not actually using this as key value. It's just using it's just like one big 
um, edge BP or pass again. In fact, maybe even what we can do is in Rust, we have a, a U64 type. So we can say, um, so we can actually just combine them into a, a 128 bit type and then pass it in as our example. Um, would that be a reference type? Yeah, I'm looking at the questions here and getting more order. Um, so the, the with IDL types are actually a disjoint type system from, uh, okay, a good documentation explaining this stuff. That's actually a really great, great question. Um, so that the component model explainer um, is a good place to start. Uh, and so I'll link to that. Um, I can recommend um, this is a good place to start. Um, this video that I'm going to link to here uh, from Luke Wagner is also a really good place to start to get up to speed on the component model. Um, it really talks, to, it's, it's called the Path of Components. It talks through kind of the whole story of how we got to the component model design, what's in it, how it's going to work. Um, in fact, some of the things that we're talking about in this, this stream will be things that are sort of recapping things that are covered in that talk. So um, if you want to check out that talk, that's a great place to take information. Um, but to get back to the question that's here, um, are we going to use reference types? Um, and so the, the, the vision here is that the, 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 the type system of, of the interface is disjoint from the WASM type system. So the interface types we have are things like strings, um, U32s, but also S32, like signed to unsigned types. Um, as opposed to core wasm, which only has like I32, it's like it, and it, it's not signed or unsigned, it's just like a, a bag of bits. Um, what a model has streams, handles uh, coming. Um, and so none of these types correspond directly to something in wasm. And what that means is that different source languages could potentially bind to these APIs in different ways. So every source language has its own way of doing a string. Uh, Rust has its string, C has its string, Go has a string, C sharp has a string, and they're all different in, in various ways. And so what we're saying is the interface types has a string and that string can get mapped into the source language via bindings in, in whatever way makes sense for that source language. And so in some situations that could use, in theory, it could use reference types, um, but it wouldn't have to. It could also like, for example, for Rust, uh, Rust expects everything to be in linear memory. And so it's gonna use I32 values as indices into a table that's somewhere else. Um, and so reference types are kind of be like, that will be on the inside in source languages that want that, but it's not what the semantics of the outside of a component, it's not what the interface of a component works like. The interface of a component has its own type system. Will there be better documentation for PV1 than PV2 than PV1? Um, the answer is yes. And in fact, that's exactly what we're doing here today. If we're writing the documentation, we're gonna make it better today, tomorrow, and, and Thursday. I'm playing PV1, sometimes you get lost. I totally get it. Uh, PV1 documentation is, is well known at this point, uh, very incomplete. Um, and so that's part of what this exercise is today is like, let's go through these APIs and write the documentation. Uh, this won't be the only thing that we're going to do, but this is a, this is sort of a start. You're like, let's kick things off. Let's cover a lot of that documentation and let's, let's document it. Let's get preview two to a better place than preview one. All right. So let's get back to, um, Detailed design discussion. So this is more template content here. I got to figure out, um, erase the template here. There are some, in fact, I, I have written already some documentation in this section already. And so we'll just let this go here. Uh, what if the system lacks sufficient entropy to an early boot? So I mentioned this earlier. This is one of the big questions about the API about what do we say about if you're running on, on Linux in a VM and it just booted up and there's no entropy yet, um, what happens? And so this kind of explains our, our stance on uh, how this works. Um, one thing I can see here that might be a little bit above the scope of WASI random itself, until I get the scope of WASI as a whole, is that the idea is that um, this WASI random API doesn't need to be the only random source that WASI will ever have. This will just be sort of like the main one, perhaps, that a lot of things will use. 
but it doesn't preclude having other APIs that might give you more advanced features. So we might eventually have, uh, you know, WASI DRPG uh, or, or a WASI um, CSPRG kinds of APIs that can basically give you more exposed functionality um, and the ability to detect things like, does the system have enough entropy or can I contribute entropy to the system or are there different sources of, of entropy that I can select from? All these kind of questions um, are potentially things that WASI could do in the future as use cases arise. But kind of the recognition here is that like there actually is a common use case for applications to say, you know, I don't want to worry about any of that stuff. With the applications, what almost all applications uh, past a certain level uh, of complexity you want is like just give me high quality random number generator, random number generator, just give me the numbers. Um, so that's that's kind of what this is focusing on. It's like let's get the, the general case uh, API addressed and let's leave special case use cases for other APIs that could potentially be WASI APIs in the future. What should happen on host platforms with weak or broken randomness APIs? Um, so this is an interesting question. Um, there's a long history of uh, computing hardware, supposedly having random number generators in hardware that don't actually work very well um, or, or don't work at all in some cases, and, or, or software applications of random number generators that don't work at all, or VMs that boot up and have a copy of the same random seed so that every VM is running with the same random number generators. Um, there's lots of different ways in which host platforms have gotten random numbers wrong. Um, and um, this is certainly uh, an opinionated stance. Um, people can have diff different opinions about this, but uh, the stance that the proposal is taking right now is that we're going to basically say it is the host responsibility to make sure that you have a good random number generator. Um, that WASI sort of can't correct for that, um, and we're not going to try to. We're not going to make an attempt to to try. We're basically going to require at a spec level that um, the inflations do a good job and and do the best practices, including things like regular reseeding. Um, we're just going to sort of encourage people to do that and um, um, and and leave it up to essentially quality implementation from from that point on. Uh, should there be a randomness resource? Uh, this is this is the easy part of documentation because we already have documentation, so I just like skim over it and stuff and and uh, just briefly talk about it. Um, yeah, so we, here we don't talk about which random number generator we're using. Um, we just have one, um, should be a stream. The answer is no for now. Um, should we specify in the API the number of bits of security? Uh, and, and bits of security is, is a technical term. I'm not a random number generator expert by any means, um, but people have talked to me who are, and they told me that some, there's this idea of, of bits of security, and you can say that some petitions have uh, like 196 bits of security. Um, Currently, we don't have a specification for this. Uh, this is largely because the host APIs that we're building on top of themselves don't have a specification for this. So it'd be very difficult for, uh, for WASI to require this if we're gonna run on top of say Linux, which doesn't provide this. Um, so we're sort of assuming that there's a concept of hosts being aware that they need their, like Linux dev U random needs to be good enough for crypto. And so if it is, then it will be good enough for WASI. Why is insecure random a fixed length value import? Um, this is actually not quite accurate anymore. It's actually a fixed sized value. Turn value, in fact. Um, yeah, so we, we, don't want, we don't want applications using the insecure random function as a replacement for actual random numbers. They should just use the regular function and it's easy to use. So there should be no reason to, to use this unless you absolutely have to. All right, considered alternatives. Um, just considered alternatives, um, I think we actually have covered a lot of the, the sort of alternative designs in the earlier questions. So I'm going to just uh, erase this section I don't think we need to sort of go through this in detail. Uh, I think we've covered it already. And um, stakeholder interest feedback for page three. Um, so I can say here that uh, if you one has a random function and it's in two chains. Um, 
I don't actually have data for how many people are actually using this particular function, but it's in the preview one, and so I think we have pretty sufficient motivation to include it in preview two. Uh, references and acknowledgments. Um, various people have uh, worked with me to develop these ideas. Um, Zach Lim, Luke Wagner, and uh, I want to call it Linux Weekly. Linux Weekly News is, is a really great website, and they have had a long series of articles over the several years about kind of the evolving story about Linux's better number APIs. Um, and so I have a link, a link to one of them in here. Um, it's kind of been a long, complex story with Linux. They have dev random and dev u random, and then dev u random has had a variety of different behaviors over time. Um, and so Linux Weekly News has done a really great job of covering that, kind of figuring out uh, this balance between what do applications need and what can the kernel provide. All right, so we've made a through there. Um, I'm going to update the table of contents later. Like right now, these documents, pretty low tech situation. We're going to update the table of contents manually. Um, I won't do that in the live stream. I'll go ahead and do that later offline. So next thing to do is pull up the WIT file. So wazi random main branch. Um, the .abidem.md files are generated files. So those actually are generated files that have like, things like the, the struct layouts um, of, of some of the records and things like that. The .wit.md file, that's the main file that we're going to edit. Um, so we're going to pull this down. And um, we're talking about wazi random API. Wazi um, random data API is technically portable between at least Unix family platforms and Windows. So, um, anywhere we can find the new docs already? Um, that's a good question. I don't have the new docs up online. I'm just editing them in my HackMD right now. Um, I'm sorry, catching my up in questions here. Um, so uh, I will I will then try to figure out if I can push these documents up to my GitHub repo at least right now, and I'll do PRs for these later. I don't have a pipeline set up to do PRs for these live, but I'll do these uh, later. Um, but I can go back and, and um, go to this readme and um, push this up to up to my WASI mirror of these things. I've been on WASI fork of these things. So then we'll go to this is my branch. And where did they go? Oh, I didn't, I didn't click it yet. So Pretty successful. So now it should show up in the repo. Uh, it's not showing up. Okay, I'm not sure why uh, the sync isn't working here. Um, apologize for that. Um, let's see if I can figure out what's going on. Do I have other branches open here? No. Last changed 48 p.m. by Sunfish. Um, push counts. Um, okay. Let's see, this has my changes in it. We did the API walkthroughs. So it's got all the, the changes in it here. Um, and so now we should be able to say, you know what I can also do is I can actually just share my HackMD so you can watch that live too. That would, that would work in addition to my GitHub thing. So I will put this in um, 
view mode. Um, published. So it's the URL. So if you check out this HackMD URL here, uh, which I apparently can't copy here, but oh, there I go. OK. So if you check out this HackMD, um, you should be able to see uh, the documents that I'm editing. In fact, you can, you can watch it live. Um, this is Wazir Random. Uh, but if you also click on the, the, the HackMD link here, um, you can see the document that I'm adding live. And I'll make sure somehow that after this stream is over, I'll, I'll make sure these things get synced up. So I got to catch up on questions here. Um, better documentation, that's what we're doing here. Module linking, part of PV2. I'm pretty unfamiliar with PV2 so far. So yes, module linking um, and, and interface types have merged into this thing called the component model. Um, the WIT IDL is based on the component model. And so PV2 is going to be based on that. Um, there's also a concept in the component model of what we call the canonical EBI. And so it won't necessarily be necessary to have component binaries uh, to use PV2. We're going to use the canonical EBI for that, which is a core WASM non component model EBI, which cor corresponds to component, component model functionality. Um, so everything we're doing here is going to be in terms of interface types, the type system, and the WIT IDL. Um, it's all based on module linking and interface types, um, but we can use it with both component model WASM and core WASM through the canonical EBI. Um, that might be something that I have to talk about more later in a separate talk, because uh, there's kind of a lot going on there. If people are unfamiliar with that kind of basic landscape, I'll have to defer that to a different, uh, maybe I'll do a different live stream, or maybe I'll do a blog, or something else. But that, that's, so yes, we're, we're basically going to be building on top of the component model stuff here in, in Preview 2. Um, having interposable random noise source is pretty useless for production use, but could help in testing and fuzzing a bunch. Yeah. Um, so random number is kind of special, because that's also like, why we don't have a handle to a random source. There's just one random source, because there's not really a concept of like different random sources as far as most applications are concerned. There just is randomness. It's, it's not like there's different kind of randomness at this level of abstraction. Um, so we kind of want to have like the, the API just is what it is, and, and it'll almost always be implemented directly by the host. Um, in order to come to the new docs, so I posted a link to the HackMD links. That's the best place to read the stuff that I'm doing live. Um, I wish I could push them to my GitHub repo. You could watch it there, but I am not able to do that at this moment. Um, seems to be a hard dependency on Kubernetes model for Wazi 2 Is that correct? Um, so it's correct in terms of Wazi 2 is built on the WIT IDL, which is built on the Kubernetes model type system. Um, the idea is that we'll have a canonical API, which is kind of a rendering of the component model semantics into Core Wasm. So it'll use the existing just what we call Core Wasm non component model stuff in the canonical API. So that's kind of our way to, to map everything we're doing in the component model stuff down to core WASM so the engines that don't implement the core component model can still implement it. So it's kind of like, we're, we're going to talk in terms of the component model type system, but it'll be done in terms of, uh, um, in the actual tooling, we can produce binaries, which are either full components or canonical kind of API uh, modules. Agree that having randomness be available ambiently is the best for security. Otherwise, you'll just guide people towards where culture moves. Yeah. And that's really like if you, if you sort of read the history for random APIs, there's a long history of, of applications where um, the application will attempt to use a random device and maybe the random device fail for some reason. And this is actually one of the problems with Linux in the dev view random API, because to open dev view random, you need to open the file, which needs which means you need to allocate a file descriptor. Um, and Linux can have file descriptor quotas. So you can actually run out of file descriptors and be unable to open dev view random at a particular point in the application. Um, in fact, attackers can even cause this to happen um, sort of deliberately. You can, you can cause an application to run out of file descriptors and then be unable to open dev view random. And then when that fails, applications then will often fall back to less secure alternatives. Um, and and that's, that's a common sort of security bugs. And so we're basically going to say, we have a random API that just doesn't fail. It just always works. Um, or um, a more subtle way of saying that is, if it ever did fail, we would fail the entire application. We would trap the entire application, take it down, and say, you know, we're unable to support what the application is asking us to do. We just fundamentally can't run it. So instead of having it continue to run in an insecure state, it'll just be 
either running in a secure state or not running at all. Yeah, exactly. So in, in the chat there, yeah, this is this is actually a pretty common story of, of applications falling back from like, oh, like you don't have the real random numbers, I'll use the system clock, or I'll use a fixed seed, or I'll use uninitialized bytes from the stack. Who knows where that gets the random source from? Um, in all cases, we don't want people falling back to those things. We want people to just use the random source. And if that isn't there, um, uh, we will sort of take care of it from a higher level. We won't force the application to try to take care of it. All right, so diving back in here um, to the WIT file. So are, are any other, other questions before we dive in here? Um, block indefinitely, yeah, that, that, yeah, that's true. Another option is to block indefinitely. Um, so it sort of is like up to the host environment to decide what it wants to do. If an application calls get random, uh, get random bytes and you're not ready yet, um, you can either trap the application or you could just block it. Uh, the application wouldn't be able to tell. Um, but the point is that like the application will never be running in a state where the get random has failed or is is uh, saying like not ready yet or anything like that. Um, that does mean that if you stick a program into like the early boot sequence of Linux, then potentially it could cause the boot sequence to hang. Um, but we're going to define that to be not our problem. We're going to take the luxury of basically saying in the spec level, we're going to say that the spec is not going to try to address that because addressing that. Um, and having any concept of not ready yet uh, exposes us to a lot more problems. Yes, uh, I believe that's an XKCD joke, isn't it? <laughs> Get random for. Um, yeah, so that, the idea here is to have that random API be so simple that you just, the only thing you can do with it is the, the correct thing to do with it. Okay, so getting into the WIT file here. Um, let me get back to my random API. So we got the, the WIT file. Um, and so a quick note about what this is. Uh, right now, the WIT file design is that we actually have kind of a, a multiple level design. We have a markdown file. This is a .wit.md, so it's a markdown file which contains wit code blocks inside of it. Um, and actually, the, the wit bind gen tooling we have now knows how to take a markdown file and strip out everything except for the wit code blocks, and then just get the wit and then process that as wit. Um, so what we're editing here is sort of this this hybrid. It's wit blocks embedded within a markdown file. The markdown file gives us sort of minimal linkability. Um, this isn't super high tech. Uh, this is a pretty simple way of doing it. Uh, it does kind of have the nice property that you can just stick a file up on, on a GitHub repo and not have to worry about having some kind of publishing pipeline to generate HTML documentation and publish it somewhere. But you just stick a, 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 a dot .wit .md file up in a repo and it's minimally readable. Um, I'm not sure that we'll always do dot .wit .md. Um, it's an idea and it's, it sort of has some nice properties. Uh, we'll see how it goes, but it's what we have right now. Um, so get random bytes. Uh, so the first function we have a, a GitHub heading, and then we start a wit code block, and then we have the triple slash is a documentation comment in wit. So now we're inside the wit, and we're doing documentation comments in wit. And so these are the comments that will be attached to this function, and they'll show up in the generated bindings for this function in, in the source language bindings. So get random bytes uh, returns len random bytes. Um, it'll return a get random bytes function. Translend and bytes. This function must produce data from adequately seeded CSPRG, computationally secure, cryptographically secure, pseudo random number generator. Um, so it must not block. And the return data is always unpredictable. The deterministic environment must omit this function rather than implementing with deterministic data. Deterministic data. OK, so. Um, I think this description is pretty self-explanatory. We can stand to uh, expand out that 
acronym because it's always good to expand on acronyms. And let's do that. Month not block and return data is always unpredictable. Um, and when I say must not block, um, I really mean must not block from the perspective of the application. So let's see. Am I Am I streaming? Is this working? Hopefully it's working. Okay. I'm gonna say it's must not block from the perspective of the calling program. Which is a little bit vague, but hopefully it gets across the idea that like, uh, it is possible that the host could cause us to block, and that's not really even something that we can semantically even describe. Um, but the intention here is that it should be uh, relatively quick to call. It should never be a slow call. It should never have to wait for more entropy, um, especially once it's been initialized. Um, CSP or NGs are are quite good once you've initialized them at, at continuing to run and producing as much data as you want quickly. So we shouldn't have to worry about blocking. All right, get my music to four. Um, and I think it's actually best to avoid duplicating the text we have here to describe it. And I delete this text here and say the same type of random data as. Represented as uh, U64. That way, we don't have to duplicate this. And if we ever have to go back and, and edit this text here, which we may well have to edit someday to be more precise about what we're doing here, we don't have to duplicate that text. So we got uh, get random bytes, get random U64, and insecure random is like the last piece of the puzzle here. Um, this returns, we could just invoke how we phrase things, return a value containing 128 bit random bits. Um, it is no longer a value import. Um, we're going to be changing things away from a value import to be um, function calls, because the with tool that we have doesn't have value imports yet. So we're going to make this a function, which returns a tuple of t scores. And You don't look at this guarantee. Uh, I can actually go into add that. In the future, we're going to like to replace this with a value import, which is a, a feature of, of wit that's not implemented yet, so we're not going to use it yet. But eventually, we want to use this to prevent this thing from being called multiple times and potentially misused. that note there um, and delete this old text about this being a value import. This value is this uh, return value is not required to be uh, computed from a CSPRG and may even be entirely deterministic. Um, so this function is required is, is permitted to just return for um, that would be a valid implementation of this function. Host implementations are encouraged to provide random bytes um, uh, to any pro to any program exposed to attacker controlled content uh, to enable DOS protection. And so this is something where implementations can then make their own choice. Um, if you have an implementation that needs to be fully deterministic for whatever reason. You can still have this function, 
and you could have a fully deterministic environment. Uh, but the trade-off is that you won't get the DOS protection. So kind of like, if you need that deterministic environment, you can get it um, uh, and, and still use this function. If you don't need that, then you can provide DOS protection. And with that, uh, we've reached the bottom of the API. So I can check back in on my comment stream. Um, are there any co comments? Are we still live here? Um, people still asking questions. Are we still connected? OK, YouTube is telling me that we're still live. Uh, hopefully, people are still here. Yes, working. Excellent. OK, so that is the end of Wazi Random. Uh, let's see if we can upload these things. And um, attempt to do a git push. All right, it's telling me that we pushed successfully, but uh, didn't actually know if these things have showed up. Um, according to this, oh, that's the web symbol was random. That's why I'm not seeing it. All right, so we got three commits ahead. We just did three commits to my fork of the repo, and here they are. So here, here we go. So these are the changes we just made. People following along want to see the changes we just made. Um, check out my repo. Uh, after the stream is over, I'll actually convert this into PRs and send this to PRs to the, the uh, official WebAssembly repo. Want model Q and A or office hours? Okay, uh, that's a great idea. I'm going to make a note of that and I'll take that uh, and, and see if I can make that happen sometime. Uh, but today is not a great day for it because we're doing. Wazi review. Okay. Uh, I've made a note about that. Uh, we should go and do a component model um, QA or office hours. Um, probably both. We probably have a lot of work to do to explain this because there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, the links I sent earlier uh, are a good place to start, um, but there'll be more coming out, and I'll have more coming out. Other people have more coming out uh, as we go forward here. So uh, let's dive into Wazi clocks. Wazi clocks API um, import from GitHub. And we're going to do the readme file first. So the readme file is the top level file that explains what this repo is all about. And we're going to dive in. So same templates, all the stuff should look familiar. Same story. We're going to do the table contents update uh, later. Um, we're just going to go through this thing and fill in all the templates, uh, parts that uh, need content. So Wazi Clocks, both have open, open implementations. So phase four criteria here, similar to Wazi Random. Um, and that's kind of the, the goal for all the all the command world APIs. So we're going to target Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, kind of our basic set. Um, ideally, it should run on more OSs than that. But that's kind of our basic minimum requirements uh, for what I think it's run on. We kind of think that if it runs on those three, then at least it's decently portable and has a decent chance of being uh, portable to other systems as well. All right, Wazi Clocks is a Wazi API for reading the current time and measuring elapsed time. Um, unlike many clock APIs, Wazi Clocks is capability oriented. Uh, instead of having functions that impose reference to clock, Wazi Clocks are past a clock handle. Yeah, so this is actually a difference, and this is an interesting difference from Wazi Random. Wazi Random does not have handles because it doesn't, that, that API is not designed around the idea of having distinct random generators. It's just random number generators. Um, in clocks, uh, this API is actually anticipating a possibility of having uh, many different clocks. Um, currently, the API just has two. There's a wall clock, which is sometimes called the system clock, uh, which kind of represents like the time in human terms. Uh, which might change because someone might come along and, and set the clock to a different thing. The system administrator can sit down and, and change the time on the system. And so the wall clock reflects that. It reflects like, what is the current time that a human would think of? Um, and then there's also the monotonic clock, 
uh, which is just a number that starts at some, some point and, and counts up at some, some rate. Um, and so you can use the monotonic timer to measure time. It never actually gets reset. Uh, there's, there's no concept of, of changing the time on monotonic timer. So it just counts up monotonically. Um, so you can use that to measure how long things take. So um, non-goals. Um, this API is not going to cover time zones. In fact, I just saw there's some discussion uh, from Bailey and, and others about uh, time zones and um, localization uh, of various kinds. Um, that's great stuff. Uh, definitely belongs. Uh, Bwazi will will grow over time and have more APIs, and so we can we can address these things in additional APIs. Daylight savings time, formatting, modifying the time of clock, all the different functionality that we've sort of deliberately kicked out of this thing because we're trying to address sort of a small set that a lot of applications need, um, and we'll we'll leave the other functions to additional Bwazi APIs that will be added later. All right, so let's do an API walkthrough. Um, delete these template things. And we're going to go to Aussie Clocks and grab the, OK. In fact, this is actually a good point. So there's actually two things going on in Aussie Clocks. There's two different WID files. We have this concept of the default Aussie Clocks. Um, and that's because it kind of reflects the use case that a lot of applications don't really care about um, which clock. And in, in fact, in commands, uh, we're, we're probably not going to want to add a command entry point argument for passing in a clock to use. Um, and so functions can just import these, uh, and they'll be ambient available to, to find a clock. Um, when I say ambient available, uh, technically, these are still capabilities. They're what we call link time capabilities. And so uh, in terms of the, the capability model and having APIs be or any, any particular functionality in API be reusable, these APIs can be reusable at link time because they'll be virtualizable at link time. That's, that's how this works. So these are there's an ambient, but they are also link time capabilities. So we have default one o'clock, one on o'clock is the way to obtain a clock handle. And we're going to put in that in a first use case. It's ambient, so we have no arguments to pass it. Um, the clock is going to give us uh, our clock handle, which will be represented in the Rust bindings as a type. So that's uh, what we get there. And we will do, call it a full bit here. Um, I may actually not include the width here in the, in the final version, because it'll be extra text to keep it in sync. Um, but it'll be, it's useful to have it for now. So we have, first of all, we get a clock. And then what can we do with a clock? And that's where we need to go to the actual wasiclocks.wit.md. And we have these APIs. We're going to talk more detail about this in a little bit later when we get into the walk through the wit file. But for now, we're going to call this now function. So right now, um, the WIT tooling we have doesn't support proper resources and handles yet. Um, they're coming. They'll be here soon, but we don't have them yet. So what we're going to do right now is have a function. We just pass it the argument. So we have the function called now, and we're going to pass it the clock argument of here's the clock to read the now from. And it's going to tell us uh, what time it is now on that clock. Um, in the future, this will look like clock.now because we'll have a resource which will have essentially methods that we can evoke on it, and it'll actually be able to use the method syntax. Uh, but for now, that's what this looks like uh, in, in the API. And then uh, use case might go on to do uh, some stuff. And then you can read now after we did the stuff, and then we can measure the elapsed time. Stop minus start. 
And so this is instant. Um, and instant here is just a type alias for u64. That was here in the in the weight file. We just have instant is just a u64. So um, this is the basic use case for the monotonic clock. You get a clock, you measure the start time, do some stuff, and measure the end time, and you can get the elapsed time from that. And I'll briefly introduce this. Measure the elapsed time of a region of code. Okay. Use case of measuring elapsed time. And then the second use case. Um, telling current uh, human time. So for the human time, we're going to use the system clock or the, the, the wall clock. Um, wall clock referring to, you can think of it as like, it's the clock on the wall, which someone might set and it might go forward and backwards when they do that, but reflects the kind of current time as humans would understand it. Um, so we're going to take a wall clock time and it also has a now function Same thing here. Default wall clock. In fact, let's put a type in this. This is going to be the wall clock. All right. Yes, I do have regular office hours. Um, in fact, uh, show up. Um, info about my office hours is here. In case wants to see it, uh, I hold these regularly. Uh, people are welcome to show up and ask whatever questions they want to. I occasionally have special themes, um, and so possibly one outcome here is that we'll have a special theme about the corner model. Um, but if not, it's just any topic that people want to show up to uh, talk about, we can talk about. So getting back to uh, wall clock use case. So we get a clock, and then we say, Okay, so a subtlety that, that I have not yet uh, incorporated the idea that we don't have resource types yet. So this this WIT file uses resource, and so I'm going to actually have to rename things in this WIT file to, to account for the fact that we don't yet have resources in WIT. We have a thing that will be replacement for resources, but we don't have resources yet. So these will actually have to get renamed. I'm going to go back and fix these to essentially be standalone functions that don't have uh, Method name faces. And then let's we'll say this is going to be wall clock now. Again, in the future, this will be replaced by you'll just have the clock value, you could say dot now on it. But for now, um, definitely there's a desire to let, let's build WASI up and, and start getting it to the point where we can use it before we wait for all the features to be fully done in the in the in the bindings. So get the correct time, wall clock now. And then we can say Okay, what do I call them here? There's seconds and nanoseconds, right? Yep. Seconds. So this is the basic use case, wall clock now. Um, it returns the value of the number of seconds, the number of nanoseconds. Uh, and the seconds is um, the number of uh, seconds since 1970, um, January 1st, 1970, the Unix epoch. Um, and then the nanoseconds is always a value from one to a billion um, of, of the, the nanoseconds to add to that. Um, so this API by itself doesn't give you the ability to convert that into what year is it, what month is it, what day is it, what day of the week is it. Um, all those kind of questions, or what time of day is it? Um, 
that is functionality that would typically be provided by a language standard library, like libc for, for libc or uh, at most, most likely to have standard libraries that can do this because the system APIs on, on most operating systems give you time in seconds and nanoseconds from some MRI. Um, so the example here is not going to show you that. They're just going to show you the raw API where you just have seconds and nanoseconds. And that is uh, the main API here. Detailed design discussion. Erase this template text. All right. Get back to here. Um, so we talked about POSIX. Uh, again, considered alternatives. I don't think there's really any major um, alternative here that hasn't already been discussed. So I'm also going to go ahead and delete this section. Um, if people think of alternatives we should discuss, we can add them. Um, but I think it makes sense to delete there. And um, similar to Wazir Random, um, in fact, I'm just going to go ahead and copy that so it's the same. Wazir Random API. Oops. Wazir Random. And with this modded box, same same thing. Um, or are they exposed to hands? Um, okay. Yeah, I don't actually have any uh, particular. Um, Acknowledgements to have for this one. I don't think there's a particular person that I. Uh, a lot of people have contributed various ideas to it, but I don't have one that I have written down as having contributed so far. Um, but definitely uh, open to people submitting ideas, and I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge you. Um, so, some things I should add here that are not covered yet. Um, maybe I should add in a concerned alternative section. Um, so, in fact, two things, and I'll preload one of them in the chat here. Um, someone suggested that we rename Wazi Clocks to Wazi Clock because um, all the other Wazi APIs are sort of singular, and Wazi Clocks is kind of this odd one that's plural. Um, I wonder if we could do a poll in this chat. Is that possible? Uh, I don't have a poll option in my chat thing. Oh well. If you like it, uh, send us a thumbs up. If not, send us a thumbs down. If you don't care, don't say anything, and I'll, I'll just make it up and call. Um, so that's kind of one question is like, what should we call this proposal? Should we read it? Wazi clocks, wazi clock. And I also want to mention another change here that we're making from preview one. Uh, preview one included two additional clocks. There is a, a, a process clock that tells you how much CPU time the correct process has taken. And there's a thread clock, which tells you how much time the th correct thread has taken. Um, we sort of uh, semi-deprecated these APIs in preview one because they're not, uh, it, it's not possible to implement these in an efficient way in, in many WASI applications. One of the big appeals of WASI for many use cases is that we don't need a full OS process to run a WASI sandbox. Um, and that allows us to run many WASI programs in the same host process. Uh, but that means that if you have the host process clock, uh, it doesn't represent something that the WASI program would represent as its own process clock, because it'll include time from other WASI, process, WASI programs. Um, and so many implementations that are doing this can't implement those process clocks very efficiently. You would require them to essentially maintain their own clock in user space, uh, which would be inefficient. And so we're leaving this out. So I'm going to write a bit of documentation about that right now. Um,
for, for process for fed clocks because um, we're, we're taking those out. That's one of the uh, preview two will have most of the functionality of preview one. We're going to take out the process and, and fed clocks. Um, let's see, in different, it shouldn't matter much. Okay, well, that's what it is. So, Okay, we have a bit of a workaround in Logic Web C that helps people port code without having to say it's broken. It'll still compile. It'll just do something a little bit different in terms of the timing that it gets. All right, so we have zero, zero feedback, and uh, I'll leave this open. Um, we'll go through the, the Git repo just to see if we miss anyone that we need to acknowledge here for one box. Um, and so that is the readme. Let's push that one up. So if anyone wants to see, uh, we just push. It's in this repo. And it's posted to the chat. So our each of the logic proposal is going to have different import module names, or is everything imported under Wazoo Snapshot Preview 2? Um, it's going to have different import module names. Um, the import module names will be derived from the interface. So we'll have Wazi Clocks will be its own import name, and um, Wazi Random, Wazi Custom, they'll all be their own you know, import module names in terms of the Wasm uh, import. <clears throat> That's something we actually had wanted to do for a long time in, in Wasm Preview 1. We had talked about this idea of modularization and modularizing Wazi is something we've been talking about for a long time, of splitting it up so we don't have a singular monolithic Preview 2 that everything has to be in. Every API can sort of be its independent thing. Um, and so uh, Preview 2 is like kind of a chance to do that. So now we're actually going to have split up APIs that will all be independent of each other. OK. So. You know that. And I think we're done with the readme. Next up is the WIT files. All right. So, pulling a file, import from GitHub. Repo is Wazi Clocks. And we're going to pull in uh, WIT.md for default clocks first. Okay, so one of the default clocks API. Um, this is already pretty well documented. I see I have a syntax error here. I don't have code comments in the right place. I can fix that. Um, the question here is, is there anything else we need to document here? 
while we're here, before we move on. Um, Thanks, we need to do like this. Use David, we need to do it to get adjusted, but uh, this looks good for now. Default monotonic clock. Sure, default monotonic clock so for general purpose application needs. This returns a new handle. So, applications with frequent need of a clock handle should call this function once and reuse the handle instead of calling the function each time. Um, I don't think creating a handle is going to be super expensive, but uh, monotonic clock should ideally have something around nanosecond precision. Um, and so you'll be able to see that if you if you look closely. So it's actually valuable to to call a function once and reuse the handle instead of getting a new handle each time. If you want to get that level of precision, um, default walk clock is going to be the same story. Um, so I think we're basically in good shape here. We did make one change, so let's push that up. Push. And proceed to the next API. 135. Okay, so we're gonna probably do this API and probably finish up for today after this point. So one more thing, and we'll probably dive into Wazi. Well, we'll see. Maybe it's a good thing to do today. So let's see if we can get into it. Select a repo, Wazi, clocks, origin file, uh, Wazi clocks, probably that MD, and pull it. All right, all changes. Okay, so this is the Wazi clocks uh, wid file. Um, quick walk through the API here. So an instant um, is the type used by the monotonic clocks. It's just the U64. A U64 representing nanoseconds. Um, 64 bits worth of nanoseconds gives us about 500 years. So this ability, this gives us the ability to measure times um, within a run of an instance up to about 500 years, which seems like it's a long enough time. Date time is the time used by the wall clock, uh, and that is a U64 of seconds. Um, if I did the math correctly, this gives us more time than the entire age of the universe at this point. Uh, so that's more than enough time for any use case on um, calendars. Um, and so we also have a nanosecond precision in that in case implementations can provide us that. Um, interesting, interesting difference here between what we're doing here and POSIX is that in POSIX, all the APIs use uh, a date time like record. They use what's called time spec, which is separate seconds and nanoseconds. Um, but uh, in WASI, we can actually have different types between different things. We're going to have different APIs. We're not going to have a single like uh, clock get time API. We have different functions to get the time for different clocks. Uh, and that represents the fact that uh, for the monotonic clock instance, um, if you want to do super high precision timing, it's actually not very convenient to have to convert between seconds and nanoseconds and do arithmetic on sort of seconds and nanoseconds pairs. Um, if you get a single U64, you can directly do arithmetic with that. That's actually easier to work with, easier to store, and faster to, to convert to other formats. Um, and so this kind of format actually gives us better precision at the sort of lowest level of, of monotonic clock. And when you're timing things, you don't typically care about times of more than 500 years. And so a U64 of nanoseconds is, is plenty. Um, so we have uh, it's the daytime hour types, um, monotonic clock. Uh, I need to go through here, and I realized that uh, I wanted to go through and convert these away from resources and towards having uh, not resources. Uh, what that will look like is that now we'll turn into, instead of being a method inside the resource, it'll turn into monotonic clock now, and it'll take uh, monotonic clock as an argument, um, and then the resource will go away. Um, but we'll sort of leave the resource in place because um, as soon as the wit tooling has it, we'll go back and sort of undo this change. Um, and, and uh, my plan is for it to be a very mechanical change. We don't have to do anything interesting. It's going to be just like replace the the, um, the type def we're going to introduce here. So instead of this resource, we're going to have uh, type u32. It's just going to be an index into this global table that we'll use instead of having the actual resources. Um, and so that's going to be a temporary measure. And We'll comment out at the bottom block of this block here. And 
I will go ahead and rename the other functions later, but I'll just show you what this looks like. Oops, that's not now, just not how to collect my solution. Um, return to the instant and the new timer. Um, there is more work that needs to be done here. Okay, so in the, in the prototype that we're building, a preview two, um, we actually have switched away from the timer approach to having a way to subscribe to a monotonic clock and get a feature for it. Um, that's not updated here. I will do that uh, at a different time. Uh, I don't have tons of time left on the stream today. Um, but I'll make a note of that. Uh, we need to go in and update these clocks to move away from timers to futures. Okay, check back in uh, the stream comments here. Um, has there been any discussion around module names as URIs or some external UDG identifier? Um, the answer is uh, yes. Uh, in fact, if you look at the, the WIT tooling and, and WIT discussion, um, uh, it's not in here yet. Um, do we have the URLs? Okay, there's actually, so here's, here's one issue. I think this is not the only issue. It's the one I have offhand. Um, there's active issue around using URLs uh, to do identifications for APIs. Um, that's definitely part of the, the plan here, but I don't have the full story uh, ready. Um, hello in Hawaii. Uh, thanks for, for showing up, this is great. Um, try to, I think that's all the questions for now. Um, and so now I've also reached the point where I have finished I guess I haven't renamed all these functions yet. New timer uh, will need to be updated. Walk clock, um, we'll need to update these for non in resources, um, but these all have comments. Um, so I really wanna focus on, for the last few minutes we have here is uh, thinking about if there's any other documentation we need to write for these functions. Time to the nanoseconds, um, monotonic clock now, value the current clock. Monotonic calling function repeatedly will produce a sequence of non-decreasing values. Um, yeah, we don't document what value the monotonic clock starts at. It just starts at some arbitrary number and counts up from there. Um, I think in many cases, it'll sort of start at zero when the WASM instance starts so that you sort of see a uniform clock. You won't see some external clock you can coordinate with some other instance. Mm -hmm. Every instance will kind of see its own clock ideally um, so that they don't have a uh, sort of shared clock namespace situation going on. Um, but but all they really need to document is that they're just monotonically increasing uh, or, or non-decreasing. Technically, you could call the function so fast that you're calling it within the same nanosecond, so it could be not increasing. But typically, it'll be uh, increasing. Um, resolution, uh, query the resolution of a clock. And we should say more about this, uh, what the resolution means. Um, but I don't actually know what, how to precisely define the resolution of a clock. Um, I don't know if it's guaranteed that the clock will only increment in this, these increments or if the precision is only guaranteed to be within an increment. So I'm gonna make a to-do comment myself. Um, look up what the resolution means and then we'll document it. I'm going to skip new timer for now because that's going to go away. Um, the wall clock. A wall clock is a clock that which measures the date and time according to some external reference. External references may be reset, so this clock is not necessarily monotonic, making it unsuitable for measuring elapsed time. Okay. Date and time for humans. Uh, I don't have anything in my mind that needs to be said here. I think that's enough. So this is the monotonic, the wall clock now. We need to value the current clock of the clock. Current value of the clock. That is 
is this clock does not necessarily have my hotic Columbus function repeatedly will not necessarily produce a sequence of non-decreasing values. Return timestamps represent the number of seconds since 1970, January 1st at midnight, also known as POSIX seconds since the epoch, also known as Unix time. The nanoseconds field of the output is always less than 1 billion. It's notable that this function is also not fallible. Um, we don't ever fail. Clock function does never fail. There's no actual I.O. happening here, and clocks don't ever fail. We just have a time. Um, one thing that could fail here is if the clock overflows. But I think we can say that the system clock uh, overflow would represent a date sufficiently far in the future that we don't need to worry about it. Um, monotonic clock overflow is actually something we should think about. We should go back and think about that. Um, what would happen if a program is running and the monotonic clock overflowed? If it ran continuously for 584 years and we ran out of clicks for the clock? Um, I'm going to make a to-do comment about that. I don't think we need to address that right now. I think 584 years is enough time to not have to worry about this for a moment, but, but we should really think long-term about um, should this trap, if it can't represent the current time, or should it just sort of saturate and it's kind of like continue to return the highest time step from then on and see like the rest of the program executes in no time. Resolution, same to do here. Get clear on exactly what resolution means, and we'll do that. Um, Montana timer, let's see, that's going to go away um, with the feature stuff we'll add in the with body pool and current. Yeah, those are just more time rate guys. All right. That is it. I think we've reached the end of Wazzy Clocks and the end of this stream. Um, thanks a lot to everyone who showed up and who stuck through this whole thing. I know this can be pretty dry stuff. And so everyone who's still still watching, um, thanks a lot. And uh, hopefully this is useful. I will be back again tomorrow at the same time, uh, 10 o'clock Pacific here is a different time UTC. Um, it's the scheduled on the live stream on the YouTube video. And we have another question. Um, how would you recommend supporting a platform use case for distributed systems with running accuracy, earliest, latest? Uh, accuracy range. Um, I don't entirely understand that question. Um, for distributed systems, are you saying, like, when you query the clock API, it, it, what would happen if you don't know the position of the clock within more than a given range? Um, all right. See everyone tomorrow. Um, I'm just going to finish up asking this question. Any other questions that come up before uh, 12 minutes from now when I'm going to officially end the stream? Uh, but I basically don't do the API. So thanks a lot for everyone who's showing up. Uh, Hope this is useful and I've had fun. Hope other people have gotten something out of it. And uh, I'll think more about this, this use case. So that's a good question. I don't have an immediate answer for the distributed systems um, and and you know keeping a coordinated clock across the distributed system is hard. Um, and it, it may be valuable to have this kind of range thing. Um, it may be the case that the WASI clock API is not appropriate for a distributed systems use case that if you need to have a clock that's coordinated and shared between multiple WASM instances, we may want to have a different API that's used for that use case. We may want to say that WASI clocks is only useful for sort of local um, time measurement, excuse me, um, and not for coordinating that time with any other kind of external concept of time. Um, that's kind of my initial reaction. Um, but that's actually a really good point. I'm going to go into the document and, and add a note to the readme about that. Let's see. Clocks.
zoom environments. Let's see what can we say about the zoom environments? Um, Special considerations. I don't want to go into details of what that is here. Um, additional idea of functionality. So the things like if there's a range of values involved, or if we need to be aware of um, drift um, or corrections or, or smearing, um, if any of that needs to sort of be serviced in the API. Um, we can say that all those kind of things can be addressed in a different um, proposal. My, my tip to answer your question. Other implications that you not rely on atomic clocks that can provide a valid range. Yeah, so if you, I, th I think what we're going to say is if you if you really depend on the clock having a correspondence between the time in one WASM instance and the same time in another SWASM instance, um, then I think what we're going to say is that has to be a different API. We need to have some different kind of coordination that goes on there. Um, WASI clocks is just about here's a clock that you can use internally in a, WAS, in a single WASM instance. Uh, one hundred clock can measure elapsed time, and the wall clock can tell you um, if you want to tell the, the user what time it is, or you want to write a timestamp into a log file. Those kind of things, and it's like for your program in your time, what what is the current time? Um, and so that's a thing that shouldn't require a range. That should just be like the system should tell you what um, the value that you should know that you should print into the log file, or that you should prevent to the user, or or you know otherwise use as your timestamp. Um, so. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, thanks for asking questions. That's really great. And I'm going to uh, disconnect here, and um, uh, I'll be back uh, tomorrow. So thanks a lot, everyone. I hope this stream was useful.